Hello, hello, and welcome to the first video in my mini-series of tutorials where I take a detailed look at the Aerosoft Airbus A320. So in this video, I'll be doing a walkthrough of the A320 cockpits to identify and explain where all the buttons are and what they do. But first, I want to get a little disclaimer out of the way. This video and the ones that follow will be a detailed look at this aircraft. So for me to explain different features and systems within the plane, these videos are going to assume that you have a good, sound knowledge of aircraft. For example, you understand things like glass cockpits, ILS landings and autopilot controls. These videos will not be suitable for complete beginners to flight simulation, however if you are interested in learning the basics of flying, you can check out my FSX tutorials playlist on my channel which takes you from the absolute basics of flying up to a level where you can comfortably jump into a plane like this. So let's not waste any more time and let's get straight to it. So I figured the best way for me to show you the cockpit would be to start at the top and work my way down. So we're going to start by taking a look at the overhead panel first. So the overhead panel is split into two main halves. You've got the upper overhead panel at the top and then the lower overhead panel at the bottom. Now, you can't actually click on anything on the upper overhead panel, so I'm going to disregard that for this tutorial, but you can see there that you've got things such as circuit breakers, and you've got a few buttons and switches for other uh, backup systems within the cockpits. So let's focus our efforts and attention on the lower overhead panel. Okay, so here we have the lower overhead panel, and uh, the way I'm going to work through this is I'm going to start at the top left and work down in sort of three columns. So I'm going to start at the top left and go down this column of panels here, and then move to the center, go down here, and then move to the right and go down here. Now there's going to be several buttons that we can't click on, and I'll identify them and highlight them as we go through. So, starting up in the top left, we have a button for the cockpit door video. Unfortunately, this is not one that we can click on, but I can show you the cockpit door video system later on. Next panel we have is the ADERS panel. So ADERS stands for Air Data Inertial Reference System. And it's these systems which supply air data to the pilot's glass cockpit displays. So that will display information such as the airspeed, the altitude, the attitude, angle of attack, and various things like that. Now the ADERS system in the Aerosoft Airbus is kind of limited. Uh, you've got three buttons here. You've got Inertial Reference 1, Inertial Reference 3 in the center, and then Inertial Reference 2 on the right. Now, you cannot click on these buttons to turn these systems on or off. However, you can rotate these knobs between Off and Nav to turn them off and on. They do also have an ATT function. However, that is not simulated in this aircraft. Also at the bottom you've got three more buttons, you have Air Data Reference 1, 3 and 2 and again you cannot click on these buttons. The next panel you have are Flight Control Computers. So the Airbus works using a fly-by-wire system. So very basically what that means is that the pilot has no direct control over the flight surfaces in the Airbus. What they do is they make inputs on a controller in the cockpit which in the Aerosoft Airbus is a side stick or a joystick type controller. Those inputs are then processed by a computer which then interprets the pilot's inputs and then moves the flight control surfaces accordingly. I will go into a bit more detail in a different video, uh, however for this I'm just going to keep moving on through the cockpit explanation. Um, regardless of that explanation you cannot click on these buttons. The next panel you have is an EVAC panel. So in the event that the pilot commands an evacuation of the plane, uh, he can click a couple of buttons here which will sound off various alarms and enable things such as the emergency lighting system and emergency lights above the doors. Again in this copy you cannot click on any of these buttons. Next you have an emergency electrical power panel. In the event that the main power system has become compromised in any way, the pilot does have several options here to use a backup system, however these buttons are not simulated in this aircraft. The next panel is the GPWS, which stands for Ground Proximity Warning System. So this is the system which gives you various warnings when you're getting close to the ground or if there's dangerous terrain in the flight path of the aircraft, and that's this system which gives you these types of warnings. Flight slow. Pull up. Terrain ahead. Pull up. 
Now on this panel you do have an option to turn off some of these systems which may be necessary in the event that you are flying into mountainous terrain. You wouldn't want that system constantly hassling you with those types of alarms so you can turn the systems off here. Like so. The next panel you have is a recorder panel. Now I'm going to be honest I don't know exactly what this does in this plane. Um, I do know that the Aerosoft Airbus does have a flight recorder function so you can record your flights you can see various events which happen during the flights and you can also um, kind of review your flight path in Google Earth for example. Um, you can enable this ground control button here. The CVR arrays doesn't work but the CVR test button does work. Again I'm not sure exactly what these do in the aircraft so I do apologize for that. Beneath that you have an oxygen panel so in the event that the cabin loses pressure the pilot can enable the masks to drop from the overhead containers on this panel. Again, in this aircraft, unfortunately, it's not simulated, so you cannot click on any of these buttons. Below that, you have a calls panel. Um, I do not know what any of these buttons do, I'm afraid. However, you cannot click on them, so it doesn't really matter too much. And then finally, on the bottom left, you have a rain repellent button, which doesn't work. And then you have a wiper knob, which does work. So you can have the wiper switched off. You can have it slow. If we have a look down there, you can see the left hand wiper is moving. And then of course fast if you're in particularly bad weather. So let's move on to the central sort of column of panels now. So at the very top you've got your engine and APU fire warning systems. Now I've reviewed a couple of uh, real world A320 training videos and simulator videos um, and you can push and manipulate these big red fire buttons here. However, in the Aerosoft Airbus you cannot do anything with them. The best you can do is hit the test button which will cause this to happen. So you can certainly be warned of a fire but it doesn't look like you can do anything about it sadly. <laughs> anyway, moving on to the next panel you have the hydraulic systems. So in the Airbus you have three different hydraulic systems labelled green, blue and yellow. And this panel allows you to enable or disable the pumps for those hydraulic systems. So you have engine 1 pump here, you've got this covered switch which doesn't work, and then you've, in the centre here you've got an electrical pump, and this is probably the only guarded switch in this aircraft that you can use that I'm aware of. So it's very very uh, touchy, you have to get your mouse cursor right in the very centre to get it to flip up like so and then you can use the button underneath that and close it again like so. On the right hand side you've got your engine 2 hydraulic pump you also have an electrical pump for pressurizing the hydraulic systems and then here you've got the PTU which is the power transfer unit so if you've ever been on an Airbus and you hear this weird mechanical sort of barking sound uh, sort of like this That barking sound is the PTU in action and the purpose of the power transfer unit is basically to make sure that each of the three hydraulic systems have adequate pressure to function normally. So in the event that maybe only one engine is running or there's some sort of problem, the power transfer unit can transfer hydraulic pressure between the different systems to make sure that they're all pressurised and all working as expected. Underneath the hydraulics you've got the fuel pump page, or the, sorry, the fuel pump panel rather. So this allows you to enable or disable the various fuel pumps within the plane. So on the left hand side you've got your left tank pumps, you've got two of them there. You've got two pumps in the centre tank there. And then between those two buttons you've got a manual mode selector. So in the, uh, in the Airbus most of the systems are automated and will automatically change depending on what's needed. If the computers determine that there's a problem then they can automatically resolve the problem without too much input from the pilot. However you can enable manual modes there so that the pilots need to manually adjust the fuel pumps there. Just above that you also have a cross feed which allows you to take fuel from one side of the plane and feed it to the other and then on the right hand side you've got two more fuel pumps for the right fuel tanks. Next up you have your main electrical panel. 
Now the top two buttons here are your battery master switches. So you've got two batteries on the Airbus. You've got battery master switch one and a voltage indication and master switch two and a voltage indication there. So the voltage indications basically tell you how much power is currently in the batteries. Now there's, there are a couple of buttons on here which you cannot use. For example, you cannot you click on this commercial and galley and cabin button here. Also you've got your generator and IDG buttons. Now the generator buttons you can click on. At the moment they're showing a fault because the engines are not running. The IDG basically stands for Integrated Drive Generator. So the engines have a electrical generator built into the engine. However, sometimes there may be a problem with the generator or there may be an electrical fault. In the event that that happens, you can actually physically disconnect the generator from the drive mechanism within the engine. And that's why you have these two IDG, sorry, IDG buttons and that's why these buttons are guarded. When you disconnect the generator from the engine, it is a kind of a one-way trip. If it's disconnected, you cannot reconnect it in flight. It can only be done by ground maintenance crews. So these buttons are always pushed as a last resort. Regardless, in this aircraft, you cannot click on them, but just a little bit of education for you guys there. In the center, you've got your APU generator there, which you can turn on and off. You've got an external power button switch there, which allows you to use external power if it's been plugged into the plane. And then you've got your bus tie, which basically ties all of the electrical systems together. The next panel is the air conditioning panel. So this allows you to control the air conditioning within the aircraft. So you've got your two pack master switches on the left and right. So the pack is an acronym for pneumatic air cycle kit. And it's these systems which control the environment within the plane. They control the pressure and the temperature of the air within the plane. So you can enable these systems by to toggling them on and off. At the moment they're showing as a fault because they work by taking pressurized air from the engine. That's why they're showing as a fault at the moment because the engines are not running. In the top left you have a knob which controls how sort of the speed of how the packs work, packs work between low, normal and high. So you may find that some airlines switch to a low setting because it improves the performance of the engines. In the top center, you've got three different knobs there, which control the temperature. So you've got one for the cockpit, one for the forward cabin, and one for the back of the plane. I believe, if I remember correctly, that the cold setting is equal to 18 degrees Celsius. The center, where the knobs are now, is the same as 24 degrees Celsius, and the hot setting is 30 degrees Celsius. At the bottom, on the left hand side, you've got an engine one bleed air switch. So the bleed air is the pressurized air which can be taken directly from the engine. And these are important for obviously pressurizing the pack systems and also for temperature control as well. You can also take bleed air from the APU in the center there as well. The ram air switch, this guarded switch here, you cannot use, so don't worry about that and uh, a couple of other switches you've got hot air which basically enables hot air to be taken from the various systems and you can also have a cross feed uh, knob there as well which works underneath that you've got a small panel here for your various anti-ice systems you've got one button which will control anti-icing for the wings and then you've got two buttons for the engines one for each engine in the middle you've got probe and window heat Normally this system uh, works automatically so you don't need to worry about it, however you can switch it on manually if you want to. And then to the right of that you've got a manual cabin pressure control panel here. You cannot click on any of these buttons. The cabin pressure is uh, automatically managed by an onboard computer, but in the event of an issue with that, pilots do have the option to manually control cabin pressure. And at the bottom, on the left hand side, you have your external lights panel. So this is where you can enable or switch on and switch off various external lights. So I'm just going to do a little bit of trickery with FSX just now. Okay, so as you can see, the screen has gone all blue and mysterious. Basically what I've done is just change the time of day to night and also managed to overlay this external view on top of my internal view here. So what I'm going to do is just demonstrate the various lights very quickly. So the first light is your strobe light. So that enables the white flashing lights on the wingtips there. Next is the beacon light, which is the red light, which flashes above and below the aircraft. 
The next switch is for wing lights. Now, I'm not sure what this does exactly. I think this just lights up some spotlights underneath the wings, so anyone who's working on the ground around the plane has a bit of illumination at night time. In the simulator, I can't see it do anything, and the Aerosoft documentation doesn't mention the wing lights in the documentation either, so I don't think this light does anything, despite being able to toggle it. Next you have your nav and logo lights, so that enables the green and red lights on the wingtips there for uh, aircraft identification. Now the next set of lights here are your runway turnoff lights. So these are small lamps which sit either side of the, uh, the front landing gear and the lights point out diagonally at an angle so it gives the pilot some illumination in front of and to the sides of the aircraft so they can see various taxiways so they have illumination to the sides of the aircraft when they're taxiing forward. Okay, so a little bit of a camera adjustment for these last couple of lights here. So the first set of lights are your main landing lights. Now, interestingly enough, the landing lights are not currently visible on the aircraft. They actually retract into the roots of the wings just under here. So if you keep an eye on these areas here, what you can do is you can extend the lights outwards, like so. So you can see the lights are now extended out from the wings, however they're not illuminated, which is where the top position of the landing lights are. So you can see you have the landing lights on, you can turn them off, and then you can actually retract the lamps back into the wing route there. And then the final button, or the, sorry, the final light switch is for the nose landing lights. So these are the two lamps on the front landing gear here. You've got one setting for taxi, which is a smaller light there, and then you've got takeoff and landing, which illuminates both lights there. The next set of buttons are for the APU, so it's very very easy to start the APU in the Airbus. You've got two buttons. You have a master switch, which turns on the computers which control the APU function, and then you've got a start button. So if you bear with me two seconds, let me just demonstrate an APU startup just now. Okay, so what you can see up here is one of the central electronic displays in the cockpit. Now what happens is when we enable the APU master switch, that basically turns on the APU computer and it automatically flicks this display onto the APU. Give that a few seconds and you see we get a message which says flap open. Basically the APU is a mini jet engine which sits right in the very tail of the plane. And here we need to wait for a message which says flap open. Basically there's a little flap on the underside of the tail which opens up to allow air to flow into that mini jet engine. So once we've got confirmation that that's open, we can hit the start switch and you can see that the APU begins to speed up. So you've got your end percentage which is basically the speed that the APU is running at. That will proceed up to 100% and then you've got your exhaust gas temperature here which usually jumps up very quickly to about 800 degrees Celsius and then should drop back down as the APU begins to run normally. Now once the APU is fully started up, you'll see you'll get some more information will pop up at the top here. You can see that the APU has its own generator, so it can provide electrical power to the rest of the plane. And you'll see that just as it gets to about 95%, you'll see that the generator will come online. Again, this is all being controlled automatically by an onboard computer. And then once the APU is ready to use, you can see you get an available message there. And then to turn off the APU, all you would simply do is just go down to the master switch and just flick it off and the APU will automatically shut down. And then the final section of this central column all relates to internal lights. So, for example, you've got an overhead integrated light here. Now, this looks like a knob that where you can control the intensity of the lights. Actually, it's more of a digital, it's only on or off. If I flick it on, you can see that it gives all of the text and all of these lights a nice orange black back kind of glow so you can easily identify and read all of the switches and all of their functions at night time or in a dark cockpit. This next switch you cannot use so uh, not going to worry about that. Uh, next you have an, uh, a dome light which is basically just a standard white light which will illuminate the entire cockpit useful for when you're going into the cockpit for the first time or you may be leaving the plane at night. And then the last switch is the annunciator light, sorry, the annunciator light, 
which lights up every single light bulb in the cockpit. So you would use this just to make sure that it, all the buttons and all the lights light up as expected and there's no problems with any light bulbs or anything not working there. Beneath that you have your seatbelt sign which you can switch between auto and on. You have a non-smoking sign which you can switch between auto and on. And then finally you have your emergency exit lights which you can have armed or on. And then finally moving over to the right hand column. So the first thing you can see here is a backup radio panel. Unfortunately you cannot use this at all. You cannot adjust the uh, the frequency or anything up there so you cannot use that panel. Over on the right hand side you have a secondary panel relating to the flight control computers. Again you cannot click on these systems much like the left hand side so don't worry about those. Next you have a cargo smoke and fire detection system. Again you cannot click on any of these. Beneath that you have a ventilation system so if for any reason the cabin becomes filled with smoke you can ventilate it however none of these buttons are available. You have manual start switches for the engines again you cannot use this. And then on the right hand side you have a rain repellent button which doesn't work and then you have your wiper which does work. And that's pretty much everything that you can do with the overhead panel in the Aerosoft Airbus A320. So let's move down to some more of the panel some other panels within the cockpit. Okay, so here we are sat in the left hand seat of the cockpit in the captain's seat and there's a couple of cool little animations that I want to show off quickly before we talk about the main displays in front of the pilots. So the first one sits just in front of the overhead panel up here and if you click on this little panel there, that little square, you can see that it pops out a magnetic compass. So if for any reason the navigation systems fail, you have a magnetic compass for manual navigation just there. Just above the pilots you have a little sun visor there so you can click on and retract that and then also to the sides of the pilots if you click on this black handle here you can open up the side windows. I recommend that you do not do this in flight by the way. So just underneath the windows you've got two controls here. You've got this uh, funny looking controller here which is called a tiller. So this is what pilots use to steer the plane when it's on the ground. Now in the simulator it is animated but it's not actually functional so you cannot click and drag it in any way. And then next to the tiller of course you have the side stick which is the main controller for the pilots. The red button on the top is the autopilot disconnect button so the pilot can hit that button and it will automatically disconnect the autopilot. This just allows the pilot to disconnect the autopilot without taking his hands off the controls. So sitting in front of the pilots you have two main displays. You have your primary flight display and your navigation display. Now you can manipulate both of these displays by using these knobs on the left hand side. So you've got this PFD knob here which all it does is just change the brightness so you can turn it off or just alter the brightness there. And then next you have a nav display. Now if you look closely you'll notice that this is actually split into two separate knobs. The smaller knob controls the brightness of the nav display there. The larger of the two actually uh, controls the transparency of the weather radar which will show up on the nav display and I'll demonstrate that in, in a short while. The other controls here, the buttons, the switches do not work. Also just above these two knobs you've got the ground proximity warning system test button here. So I'm just going to hit that again just so you can see what that looks like. Light slope. Pull up. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Now the other two main displays which sit in the centre of the cockpit are these two ECAM displays. So ECAM stands for Electronic Centralised Aircraft Monitor. And what these displays do is basically give information about the major aircraft systems. So the top ECAM or what's known as the upper ECAM usually displays information about the engines and also any critical uh, messages will pop up in the sort of lower third of this display here. The lower ECAM can be toggled so you can look at different systems on this lower ECAM and I'll show you how that's done just now. So if I just pan the view down quickly here uh, we can actually control what's displayed on this lower ECAM with these buttons down here. 
Now you've got four knobs here, you cannot click on any of those, but these two on the left you can use and they just change the brightness of the ECAM displays very much like the primary flight display and the nav display. So most of these buttons, if not all of them, you can click on. So basically these just display different pages on this lower ECAM. So at the moment it defaults to the door page. So it shows you what doors are open and what doors are closed. If you click on Edge here, this gives you additional engine information. And then you've got bleed air system information, air pressure or cabin pressure page, electrical page, hydraulics page, fuel page, APU page which we saw earlier, the air conditioning page, again we've got another door page there, wheel information and also flight controls there. And you can also click on the button again so that none of them will light up and the plane will default to the most appropriate page for which, whichever stage of flight you're in. Also for a fun little fact if you click this red emergency cancel button it brings up a nice little credit screen so we can thank everyone who helped work on this aircraft. Uh, on the bottom here you've got a status page so that usually brings up if the or shows you if there's any major problems usually it says it's normal and you've also got a recall button which will bring up any error messages which need to be investigated. So also in the center of the cockpit you've got several other instruments and buttons and various things. On the left hand side here you've got a standby flight display so this gives you information about your speed on the left, altitude on the right and you can change the barometric pressure setting by rotating that knob there. You can also enable an ILS landing system on that as well so it's pretty much an all-in-one standby instrument. On the left hand side here you can see that we've got a terrain on nav display button so what I'm going to do is just flick to another view very quickly so I can demonstrate this here. So if I click this button on, what that does is that prompts the radar in the front of the plane to draw the terrain around the aircraft. Now remember I said that the second knob over here controls the transparency of the weather radar. Well it also works for the terrain radar as well. So if I roll that down you can see the terrain overlay gets very dim and then very bright. So you control the overall screen display with the small knob or the screen brightness with the smaller knob and then either the weather sorry the weather or radar information with the larger knob there. Also to the left of the ECAMs you have a standby VOR or ADF instrument here which is a more analog version so it's not a digital version it's more of a classic VOR and radio instrument there. And then just underneath that you've got this little unit here. Now this is not simulated in this aircraft but this unit is called the DCDU which stands for Data Communication Display Unit. You might also hear this be called an ACARS unit which stands for Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. So this unit is used to transfer messages which are sort of non-urgent to the aircraft so things like METAR reports or if an airline needs to send a non-urgent message to the pilots they can send it through this system here. On the right hand side up at the top we've got our landing gear indicator lights to begin with and then beside that we've got a brake fan so if the brakes get too hot for any reason you can enable the brake fan which will start up a fan which sits in the wheel hubs to cool off the brakes. And you can see that as we turned on that system, we got a little notification on our ECAM display here telling us that the system is enabled and active. Beneath the landing gear indicators, you've got your auto braking selection, so you can select low, medium or maximum pressure. Beside that, you've got a toggle switch for the anti-skid and nose wheel steering, so you can toggle that on, on on or off as needed. And then we've got a second button for terrain on nav display. As you can see the terrain on nav display enables both nav displays there. Next to that you've got a simple digital clock which can be used for additional timing. And then underneath that you've got the landing gear lever which is a standard up or down there's no intermediate position there. And then beside that you've got the brake pressure gauge there. 
There is one more panel which sits in front of the pilots and that is this thin strip of buttons and controls here. Now this is known as the glare shield. So let's start on the left and work our way across. Now there's two buttons here and you cannot click on them and I'm not sure if they light up at all but you cannot seem to do anything with them. I don't remember seeing these light up while I've been flying the plane so I'm not sure if these are simulated or not. These two buttons, the ones which are one on top of the other, are simulated. These are your two warning lights. So the top one is your master warning and the bottom one is your master caution light. So the master warning lights up in red when there's a significant problem that needs to be dealt with and then you've got your, your uh, caution light which lights up in yellow when there's an issue. So I can demonstrate the master warning just now by initiating a fire test. And you can cancel the alarm by pressing the button. And the same goes for the master caution there. Now just along the, from that you've got this chrono button here, so what that does is that starts a timer in the cockpit. So if you keep an eye on the nav display just down in the bottom left corner here, if I press the chrono button, you can see we get a timer that starts. If you press the button the second time, it stops the timer and then if you press it a third time, it resets the timer. So this is useful for pilots who want to measure how long their engines are running at full power for example, or measure the duration of the flight, for example. And then the final button here, which is not simulated, is the side stick priority. So in the event that both pilots are trying to control the plane from both sides of the cockpits, one pilot will have priority over the other. So in the event that both pilots are trying to make input controls, an alarm will sound in the cockpit and this will indicate which pilot has priority, either the left pilot or the right pilot. Now the next panel along on the glare shield is this panel, which is the EFIS control panel. So EFIS is short for Electronic Flight Information System, and the buttons and knobs on this panel basically control what is displayed on these screens here. So the first indication you have here is the Q&H, so this is the master barometric pressure setting. Now you have two ways of setting this, you've got inches of mercury, and hectopascals or millibars and you can rotate the outer knob to switch between the two. To adjust the pressure you simply put your mouse cursor over and roll your mouse wheel and you can see that the Q&H is listed as 1015 and it's also displayed on the primary flight display at the bottom there. Now if you want to change that to standard pressure if you right click on the button that will pull the button out and you see it it uh, sorry reverts to standard pressure and standard is located there. To get it back to a custom setting you just left click on the button and it reverts back to a setting that you can manually change. Beneath that you've got two switches, you've got your flight director switch which you can toggle off and on and then you've got your landing system switch which brings up your ILS landing um, display there. The rest of the controls on the EFIS control panel all relate to the navigation display here. So along the top you've got a row of buttons. Now these buttons display different nav aids on the, uh, on the map there. So for example it's set to airport just now and you can just about see we've got an airport listed where we are just now. If you hit the NDB button you can see that the information changes and you get a new icon on the display there. We can do that for VORs, we can do that for waypoints as well, and you can also do that for constraints along your flight path. Now the left hand knob controls how the information is displayed on the screen, so at the moment it's in arc mode, so that gives you a, a sort of an arc or a view in front of the plane. If we change that to plan, that gives us a north, south, east, west view and you can see in 360 degrees all around the aircraft. We can flick that to nav, which is more typical of your classic horizontal situation indicator, and you can see in 360 degrees all around the plane. However, 
the top of the compass will always point in the same direction as the plane's heading. You also have a VOR there, so you have like a digital VOR indicator. And then you've also got a landing system. So again, that's very similar to a uh, horizontal situation indicator. However, this also gives you glide slope information as well. Now you can also change the range or how the distance that this display works at. Now it's worth noting, if I just flip this back into arc mode, now it's worth noting that the range is only applicable to the arc mode of the display. So for example, it's set to 10 nautical miles there, so the outermost ring is 10 nautical miles away from the aircraft. I can flick that up to 20, and you can see the intermediate lines also have their distances numbered as well. 40, 80, 160, and so on. Flick that back to 40. However, if I flick this into nav mode, have a look at the range here. You can see the intermediate range is 10 nautical miles and the outer range is 20 nautical miles, not 40 as it is on this knob. So the range here is only applicable to the arc mode. Every other sort of viewing mode here is half of the distance on the range there. And then beneath the two knobs you've got two uh, radio controls. So these are three-way switches, so you can have them in the center, which is the off position. You can have them on an ADF radio. Now, I believe a limitation of FSX is that it only uses one ADF radio, so you can't use the second ADF, I believe. Or you can flick both switches to the right, so you have a VOR1 radio and a VOR2 radio there. And of course, if you've got the frequencies dialed into the aircraft, then you'll get a digital sort of needles pointing at the VOR stations um, indicating their direction. Now one other thing to note is that there are actually two EFIS control panels, one for the captain side and one for the first officer side. Now in the real aircraft these can be worked independently so the captain can have one setting on his nav display and the first officer can have his own custom display here. However in the Aerosoft Airbus these two controls are mirrored so you can see as I flick between the different buttons it automatically mirrors it on the opposite side of the plane. If I can flick the range here and if you watch the range knob it moves on both sides. If I move the barometric pressure on one side it adjusts the barometric pressure on the other side as well. And then front and centre we have this, the FCU or Flight Control Unit and this is where you'll be doing most of your interaction with the autopilot. So you can see it's like any other standard autopilot panel, you've got speed here which you can adjust with this knob, you've got heading, uh, altitude and vertical speed. Now there's several other auxiliary buttons here, you've got a button to switch between speed and Mach hold. You've got a heading and track mode, or vertical speed and flight path angle. Now I'm not 100% sure how this track and flight path angle mode works. I do know that it's used for non-precision approaches, um, so I'll definitely be looking into that in a future video. And then on the right here we've got a metric altitude here. So what this does is this brings up the altitude in meters. Now it doesn't actually do that here on the autopilot panel, but if I go across to the primary flight display there, you can see that it has the altitude listed in meters there as well. So that's how you can change between, or that's how you can measure your altitude in meters or feet. Beneath those you've got several square push buttons, you've got a localizer hold button there, you've got autopilot 1 and 2 and an auto throttle there. You've got an expedite button which doesn't work and then you've got your approach hold button there. Now there's one other feature on the autopilot panel that you need to be aware of so I'm just going to adjust the view quickly just so I can show this off. Okay so what you can see on the lower half of the screen here is the view of the FCU from the captain's seat. Now rather than simply rotating these buttons what you can also do is push and pull them so what I'm going to do just now is if you keep an eye on the speed knob here and watch what happens when I left click on it you see how it gets pushed into the panel and then if I right click on it you see that it gets pulled away from the panel 
And you'll notice also that the speed value change there, when it's pushed in, it's dashed out and it has this little yellow circle. When it's pulled out, whoops, sorry, when it's pulled out, you see it returns back to a normal number. What is that? Why is that happening? Basically, what you're doing is you're transferring control of the autopilot. You can either tell the autopilot to fly using values that the onboard flight computers are using, or you can fly using the values that the pilots give the autopilot. So the best way to think of this is when you left click you're pushing the knob into the panel so what you're doing is you're pushing control of the speed to the plane and that's why this is dashed out and why you have the little yellow circle indication there because that is telling you that the plane is going to automatically calculate the best speeds to fly at and that works the same with the heading as well so if you want to tell the plane, actually, no, I want to fly at a specific speed, you then right click on the knob and pull it out, and then you can then set the speed, and the autopilot will automatically fly to that speed. And it works exactly the same with the heading there. So when the heading mode is dashed out and has the yellow circle, that means that the plane will fly the flight path that has been programmed into the FMS. Now it's worth noting that this does not happen with the altitude. The altitude indication is the only number that will not change. However, you can set the altitude and then push this one in as well so that you get the yellow indication there. So that means that the plane will climb to that altitude in the most efficient manner or the best way possible. If you right click on the knob and pull it out, then that initiates something called an open climb mode, which means that the plane will just simply get to that altitude as quickly as possible. And then vertical speed, again, you can pull and push. However, it works slightly differently. When you push the vertical speed into the panel, what that does is that automatically levels off the plane into straight and level flight, no matter what altitude, whether it's climbing or descending, pushing the knob will initiate or will tell the plane to level off. And then what you can do is if you set a vertical speed and then pull it, that will put the plane into what's known as a vertical speed mode and the plane will automatically climb or descend at the vertical speed that you tell it. So one other thing to be aware of is that the adjustments that you make on the FCU here will change the mode that the plane is flying in. So what I'm going to do is just bring my view over here to the uh, primary flight display, sorry. And you'll notice that on the top of the primary flight display, you've got several different columns here. These are, no, or sorry, this whole area is known as the FMA, or Flight Mode Annunciator. And this tells the pilot what modes the plane is flying in. What does that mean exactly? Well, at the moment here, if you have a look at the FCU, you can see that we are in kind of a manual heading select mode here. However, if we push the knob in to tell the plane, I want you to control the heading, you see here that we get a little indication here, a little alert, which tells us that the plane is now in nav mode. Now you see here we've got OPCLB as well, which is basically short for open climb, which means that the plane will climb to this altitude. Now if we wanted to fly by vertical speed, for example, what we could do is roll the vertical speed up there and then pull control and you can see here that we get VS plus 500 so that's telling us that the plane is in a vertical speed mode of plus 500 now if we push the knob in you can see that we get vertical speed 0 which is, tells us that the plane is going to level off and fly a vertical speed of 0 which is effectively level flight so you can see here that the FMA has five separate columns and each column has three rows where information can be displayed. Now I'm not going to talk about all of those just now but as we go into more videos and as we begin flying I will talk about some of these different modes in detail uh, because there's quite a lot of them and it's too much to explain in this one video. Okay and the last major area of the cockpit we'll look into will be the centre pedestal the area which sits in between the two pilot seats. So we've already had a look at the center here, we've got the ECAM sort of control panel here. Dominating the left and right hand side you have the MCDUs or the multifunction control display units. 
So on the left hand one, this is where you'll be doing most of your interaction with the FMS or flight management system. So you can see you can flick between different pages and you'll be able to type in various bits of information in the scratch pad at the bottom there. I'm not Again, this is not something I'm going to cover in this video, but we'll look into it in more detail as we go through future videos. On the right hand side, you've got a second MCDU, which is more of a, a sort of an options menu within the plane there. So you can see that you can change the aircraft state. So you can have it cold and dark, turn around, taxi or ready to take off. You can open doors from here. You can enable the various ground services fuel loads, passenger loads and so on and so forth. So this is more of a kind of a, an options menu here for the uh, for the actual plane rather than serving any functionality during a flight. Beneath the MCDUs we've got the communication radios here. So you've got one on the left and one on the right. So this is your VHF1 radio and then VHF2 and these do work independently from each other however one power switch on one radio will flick both there. However, the actual radios do work independently. Now, I said that these are your two communication radios. If you want to manually set your navigation radios, you would need to go into the MCDU up here, and then you can set in your VOR, sorry, VOR1 frequency there, and then VOR2 details in there. Now, you can enable the navigation radios for um, Morse code identification and things like that. If you right click on these little knobs here you can switch these on and that will enable things like the Morse code identifiers to be heard when you're using navigation radios. Most of the other buttons on here you cannot click on. You can adjust the frequency and you can transfer it there between the active and standby boxes but pretty much every other knob and button is not usable apart from the power switch there. Underneath that on the left hand side you have two light switches here. Now these are very similar to the one that we saw up on the overhead panel. When you flick that it just gives everything a nice kind of orange back backlight there so you can easily identify things on the center panel at night time. And you'll notice here that moving one will rotate both. And it also enables and disables the switch here on the right hand side. Underneath the lights here you've got the weather radar panel so this is where you make adjustments to the weather radar and you can tweak the various settings there to either tilt the radar up or down or have the radar more sensitive by adjusting the gain there. You can also change between different modes so you can have it picking up only weather or weather and turbulence and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go into too much detail there but pretty much all of the switches apart from this PWS one will work so um, we'll look at that again in a future video in more detail. Now moving across we've got the engine master switches so when you're starting an engine you basically have an on off switch one for engine one, one for engine two. Beneath that you've got this rotating knob which allows you to change the start mode so you can go between crank which I'm not sure if it works in this plane or not, normal modes and then your ignition or start modes there. And then on the right hand side you've got two buttons here, you've got uh, the aids print which I believe is related to takeoff performance. You can actually print out a, uh, a page of information which gives you takeoff performance for the plane. Uh, so you can do that if you wish and you also have a flight recorder event there so if something happens during the flight and you want it to be kind of noted or bookmarked on your flight recording uh, or the, the recording of this flight sorry get my words mixed up uh, then you can hit that button there and that will sort of bookmark uh, a particular time during the flight so you can go back and review what happened there and then finally, underneath that, you've got the transponder panel. So none of these switches work. I believe this one does. I'm not sure what it does, I'm afraid. Um, and then you can obviously adjust the transponder code in there using the keypad. And then you can flick between the various modes. So standby all the way up to TARA, which is used during the flight. 
And finally, of course, in the centre we have the throttle quadrant. So the two wheels on either side are your trim wheels, so you can adjust the trim of the aircraft using those. The red button here is the auto thrust disconnect, and then you've got two black levers which sit in front of the throttles, which are your reverse thrust. So if I just enable that just now, you'll see that these levers will pull upwards. And then we'll drop back down and you're back into idle. Now, the throttles on an Airbus are not like any sort of standard throttle. It's not a case of you know, more power, less power, more power, less power. The Airbus throttles have a detent system and it's more like selecting a particular thrust mode for the autopilot or the auto thrust system to fly with. What do I mean by that? Well, you'll notice here on the auto throttle system, we've got several different markers for thrust uh, positions there. So you've got zero for idle, you've got a climb setting, you've got a flex or max continuous thrust setting, and then you've got a toga setting. Now if you listen very carefully, you'll hear that the throttles will kind of pop into what are known as detents. So if I move up to climb, you hear how it kind of clicks into place. Move up to flex, it clicks into place. Move into toga, clicks into place again. So basically what you're doing with that is you're telling the auto throttle system which thrust modes to use. So at the moment we're telling it to use takeoff or go around mode which is absolute maximum thrust that the engines can provide. Then you have flex which is more like a derated takeoff setting and then you've got climb. Now rather interestingly in the Airbus after you take off you may move the throttles to take off or go around or if you're doing a derated takeoff you might move them into flex. Shortly after takeoff the auto thrust system will tell you to move the throttles into the climb position so move the throttles there. Once you've moved the throttles there, the pilots will not touch the throttle for the rest of the flight. Only when they're landing will they reduce the throttles from climb back to idle. With the throttles in the climb position, the auto thrust system will take care of absolutely everything. When the plane is climbing up to cruise, it will adjust the engine speed. When the plane is descending, again it will adjust the ending speed without the pilots moving the throttles in the cockpit at all. Okay, and then finally, at the back of the centre pedestal, we've got several more controls here. The first on the left-hand side are your speed brakes. So if you want to arm them, you can right-click, and it just pops them up into the top of the motion there. Or you can click and drag to move the speed brakes back and forth. Same with the flaps. You can move them to position 1, 2, 3, 4, which is full, or up to 0. You notice in an Airbus, the flaps don't have a particular number of degrees of extension. It's simply position 1, position 2, position 3 and position 4. Now depending on the stage of flight and which position you move the... or which setting you move the flaps into, it will also extend flap, sorry, slats or the uh, extensions to the front of the wings as well. Next on the left we have the cockpit door which doesn't work, however you can click this video button. It's a cool, almost useless little feature, but I'll show that in a second. Uh, and the other main controls here that you have are your rudder trim in the centre, so you can turn that right or left, or reset it, and then your parking brake, which is on or off. And then finally, at the bottom, we've got a manual gear extension lever, which doesn't work, and a slew button, again, which doesn't work. At the very start of the video I talked about a cockpit door button that wasn't available on the overhead panel. This is where you can use it here, so you'll notice, if we have a look at the back of the cockpit there, we've got a little TV screen there, and that will show basically what's on the other side of the cockpit door. Now if we press that little button, you can see that we get a little static image there. So I don't think that any you get any animation on there, so it's a small bit kind of useless feature there, but you can turn that on. Oops. And turn it off again. And that, to my knowledge, covers pretty much everything that you can do with the Aerosoft Airbus 320 cockpit. So in my next video, what I'm going to do is we're going to take a look at taking this plane from its cold and dark state, which is completely powered off, all of the screens are dead, there's nothing happening. 
we'll take that from cold and dark up to a turnaround state where everything is powered on and ready for passengers to board and ready to depart the gates basically. So I hope you'll join me for that video but for now thank you all very much for watching, take care out there and I will catch you all later.